wine today in Paris. Well, I'll be pouring a rosé if anyone noticed that. So I'll be thinking of you <laughs> while I'm drinking it. And we are live. So welcome everyone for joining us for week seven of United We Taste. I hope we're getting better over time. You know, at this point, I'm gonna need a video editor at one point. But, uh, <laughs> we finally made it to France. And again, I'm Cha McCoy, one of the co-founders for United We Taste. And this is a global virtual tasting group. So everyone here joining me from around the world, uh, mainly France, um, are actually experts or very knowledgeable about French wine, even French winemaker, French tourism, and we'll introduce ourselves. But the intention is to collect uh, folks from the industry to have a joint solidarity during this COVID-19 social distancing moment to think about wine and country. So this group force energy that put positive energy to you guys. So this is titled Forever France. I say that with a sigh, but they're gonna make me a believer. I know they are. So stay tuned to that. Again, Cha McCoy, sommelier from New York City, uh, quarantined in New York City, but live in Lisbon, Portugal. I'm a wine event experience host, as well as a sommelier on the floor. Right now, no floors, so love to hospitality right now. Philippe? Yeah, hello and good afternoon. My name is Philip, and I'm reaching you from a small town called the Agda in the wine region of Bairrada in Portugal. So my passion for wine started when I was a little boy, uh, helping and watching my grandparents producing wine, some garage wines here. So today I work as a business consultant, and I also run a blog called Vinho Ishima. So toast to France. Oh, with the ladies first, Carrie. Hi, I'm Carrie Sumner, and I don't think I'm supposed to say where I am at, but uh, I grow and, uh, and produce wine in France. I am an American, obviously, and um, I met my husband here, who is Swiss, so we are Swiss-American making uh, wine in France. That's joining us, Carrie. Tanisha. <laughs> Thank you for the invitation. Hello, everyone. I'm Tanisha Townsend, another American in France. I'm originally from Chicago, Illinois. I've been in Paris now for about uh, five and a half years. And I have the lifestyle wine tasting and lifestyle agency, Girl Meets a Glass. The uh, website and blog of the same name. I host tours and uh, day trips to Champagne and wine tours around the city. Well, when the city opens back up, then we'll get back to that. But for now, I drink wine on Saturdays with my friends and forever friends. <laughs> and thanks for coming back, Tanisha. Tanisha, sure. if you've seen the first episode with Italy, she was um, open to some Italian wines in France. So good thing the doors were closed there. People would have already shamed her. But <laughs> yeah, it would have been a bad situation. <laughs> and Niels? Yeah, so hi everybody. My name is Niels. Uh, I'm originally from Sweden, but I have been living here in France for the last uh, 13 years. So I'm based in Paris. Um, so I'm, an, I'm a consultant and a WSCT educator. So most of my time is spent teaching WSCT courses, wine education for a number of different schools and uh, companies here, in, mainly here in Paris, okay, but also in Sweden. So I work between the two countries, but that's, uh, that's me. WCT Thanks, Niels. And, and Gilliam? Hello, I'm Guillaume. I'm based in Paris. We advise the luxury companies. It could be in wine business or cosmetic or jewelry. It's more into uh, marketing, branding. And uh, I, I'm not, I was not born in, uh, in Paris. I'm from the south of France, near between Lyon and Avignon, where the, the sun is actually. And um, I'm so happy to be with you today. Thanks, guys. So let's do a little cheers first before we get into some conversation. You can't Thanks see for my joining. Glass. Oh yeah, you oh my, can you show your glass with your crazy background? <laughs> <laughs> cheers. Special effects. I was yeah, trying to be special. in France. 
this is making me feel like I'm in France because you know, know looking at my I, apartment, my apartment could be anywhere. I could be in Chicago. True, right? right? This white wall, it can be any right. white wall. That's it. I'm going to take some... I was in one virtual group just for like five seconds about this. And I feel like someone switched the background way too much. It went like crazy. She was in Tahiti and then she was in France. And she, I was like, okay, this is no, too, too much. much green screen. So I think yeah. some of us is getting carried away with the Zoom. <laughs> but um, so yeah, okay. So I already told them I have a special place in my heart for Loire Valley. So let's, let's make it clear. It's not that I dislike France or French wines. I think that when it comes to French wines, and so you can already know that I'm not gonna have a Loire Valley now just because I said that. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I just, it's one of these things that French, French food and wine culture team, seems to dominate, right? You have Americans here who've moved to France uh, to make wine, to learn about wine, to teach people about wine. Uh, Swede, same thing. Um, Gilliam, you are French, so you, you're our native, you know, <laughs> expert here. But of course, you moved up to Paris, so I'm sure that means that you can contact more people being, uh, when you talk about wine versus staying in your, in your hometown. So what, uh, this is, sounds very generic, but what makes French wine so great? Uh, I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not sure France dominates the, the wine uh, business or the okay uh, everywhere I some facts <laughs> there, there no, are some numbers no that shows. <laughs> I, I drink, a couple bar charts uh, and graphs i drink plenty of wines and everywhere you meet friends and you drink their wines everywhere in the world you you find some some great wines uh, when it comes to when it comes to europe you have italy you have spain you have um, plenty of countries uh, they love wine, but they love food also. And uh, the most important in our culture, I think, is the way how you, you pair wine and, and food. And the reason why we have wine is because we have food. And this is extremely important for, for me. When we, when we go to Italy, you have so many places where you have great wines and you have great food. When you go to Spain, that's the same. When you go to Greece, that's the same. In France, it's the same. What I like in France, it's also you have this part of culture which is extremely important. It's not only about wine, it's not only about a taste, it's about a story. When you go to Burgundy, I, I was not, I, I, I didn't grow in, uh, in Burgundy, but I love Burgundy. When you go to Burgundy, 800 years uh, ago, you had monks growing vineyards, and thanks to them, now you have. Chevalier Montrachet, you have Chambertin, you have Musigny, all these great wines. It's 800 years of work, of hard work, every day, every year. And that makes something unique. The villages are beautiful, the nature is beautiful, the story is beautiful, and the wines are great. And wine is not only about the taste, it's about also the, the story. And, and in France, there are some places where you have some beautiful story to, to tell, and this is what I like. So, but Gilliam, you started out, you got to where I wanted you to go. So in your case, you said the 800 <coughs> years of work is what, um, I guess, highlights these regions and sub-regions that you just mentioned. Um, but the question really is not so much about, like, I think we all, because we're in the industry, appreciate wine from everywhere. But you understand from the consumer perspective, the French wine, French grapes, are, is what the world knows. Like, since I work a lot with Portuguese wine, I have to first explain Portugal to people. I don't have to explain Pinot Noir, you know. And, you know, I mean, to, to an extent I do, when I, but I mean, people already have at least an idea about Pinot Noir, which is a French varietal. Um, and so more the question is, how, what put France, in your opinions, in that position where we're not hand-holding to explain Chardonnay or um, any of these other, you know, more what we call <clears throat> international grapes that started mainly in France, right? And so, um, and the same thing when it comes to regions, we don't have to tell people that, we may have to tell people that Champagne is in France, but we, um, if they have no clue that it's a place, but they do know what Champagne is versus me having to explain what Frenchy Cotta is from Italy or Cava from Spain. So, 
what you think, what was the leg up that France have? And this is obviously pre Facebook, social media of all sorts. So um, what do you think gave French wine that spread in love that it did from people everywhere? Anyone can answer, sorry. I don't, sorry, I don't have the answer. <laughs> okay, is this your opinion? I just want I to think, see someone. I, like, I was waiting that, for the answer. Yeah. I'm like, I think part of it might just be something as simple as if we're talking about the major regions that we all know today, France was kind of the first. I mean, I know we have, you know, Georgian wine and um, wines from other places that started before France. But if we're talking major wine regions and sales and, you know, import, you know, and export, I think it was France first. So I think they have the leg up. Did what first, first one. What did they do first? Well, would anybody believe that the British had anything to do with that? Yep. I mean, we believe it, yes, because uh, we know, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> since Britain isn't making since they aren't really doing wine now I mean yeah they have the English sparkling wines but I think uh, yeah people just knew France first I mean and, and they and probably Carrie, you're connecting that yeah. to the fact that um the, the Brits get needing wine obviously that's why that, that's how comport is so uh much a big deal right they needed wine and port wine got uh, exported for the first time and needed to have this kind of demarcation right. So and then wasn't the it Brits like love for wine that said, where can I get wine? And then they got it from well, France, which was the closest. I feel like they also brought like a system of prestige to it or, you know, they they graded it. You know, they did. It. Wasn't it the Brits who drained out the, the swamps of Bordeaux and yeah. and then the Bordeaux became the first, the, the, the Grand Cruz. And um, and then, of course, you had. Um, the Pope with Chateauneuf de Pop, and then you had like um, Napoleon on his battlefield. I mean, maybe, I, and I'm not, I don't know anything, but yeah, and I'm not even I don't know. People, like, maybe the this <laughs> history of this and, and how the French, um, or this is just what I wonder if it's the, how the French, like um, how it's, woven into the history of France and you hear about it the most that you hear about it the most yeah I just and that's these uh these questions are genuine questions from me like <laughs> this is uh this is not like uh you know a think tank or how we fix something or how do we uh, <laughs> I'm gonna take all these tips to use towards Portugal um but maybe that's a good idea too but um but no just literally because I realize um, and Niels, if you have something to throw in there too before I ask another question, um, that in Philippe, since you now are French with the beret, if you have some more, please tell us. <laughs> <laughs> but I really just um, feel like I always say that, you know, like we have Madeira as well as Port. And a lot of people usually hear about Port wine as fortified wine, but they may have never heard of Madeira. And I just go, oh yeah, because Port wine has better marketing. I just say that when I'm like doing a uh, tasting or hosting a class because to be honest, it's like one just had a better Instagram account, right? One just, you know, it got farther in life because more people talked about it, more people. So when it comes to French wine, is it really just that? Or is there something else I'm missing? You know, you guys are on the ground. So I'm just trying to hear what you are being yeah. fed from as a foreigner living there and as a local when it comes to why, yeah. like you said, Tanisha, People are just finding out, meaning others that's not in the industry about wines from Georgia or that, you know, wine started before France. <laughs> you know, some people don't know that for some reason, so. Yeah, well, I, I personally, I, if, if I were to answer the question, why are French wines so good? I would say that the, the main reason is really diversity. And that's what, I, that's what I try to highlight for my students as well, that you could take any wine style that exists anywhere in the world and you will find someone, at least one or two people here in France making that wine, okay? Not necessarily in an Appalachian or whatever, but you have such an enormous diversity of wine styles at every possible imaginable price point. Um, and yeah, I, I think you have that in many countries, um, but really for me personally, as a wine educator, having lived here for 13 years now, that really is the, the, the main, that's how I would answer that question. Why are French wines uh, so great? Uh, so that, that would really be the, the main point for me. Yeah. Now, again, this is not me. I'm not playing devil's advocate. I'm, I'm not saying But that. you are. 
<laughs> but okay, let me let me let me carry on, carry on. No, let me go to another. Let me go to on. another question from this though. It stems the same thing because then my first thought is like, well, so is Portuguese. They go with these great styles as well. But in this case, when we're talking about French wine, let's uh, speed the time up, right? China loves French wine, right? <laughs> so tell me what makes wine from France, like collectors, um, the cult wines that are coming from France. Why would a country like China, in your opinion, and I actually do, I'm doing a podcast with somebody in China later on this next week, so I'll get more details on this too soon. But why would the same thoughts that I was asking you about in <clears throat> history, what made uh, French wine now the ones that everybody knows or the grapes people know, why do you think today a place like China um, is so crazed? I worked at a wine shop um, and I remember this one guy, he will come in, Chinese guy um, will come in every week. And he's like, no, do you have, he, he would ask for one producer like every time he comes and we tell him no every time. I'm like, we don't carry that. Unless you're gonna order a case, you no know, one's spending that kind of money. <laughs> Why, you know, and I'm trying to think, was it like a Chateau Lafitte or something? But I'm like, in this store, Probably. no one's a- no one's asking about that but you. I have no, like, there's no reason why I should order that unless you're going to buy a case of it. Then I'll order it, especially for you, and you got to give me some money in advance because there's no way, because you can't like bail out on this wine on me. Um, but it was interesting because I like seen it firsthand. Not, I'm not just like from what I hear and what I read, that also supports what I saw on the floor. And this was probably 2018, 2017, when I was at this store. And he would come in every week to see who else I got that he thought was worthy of uh, his uh, cult collection. So if anyone want to speak on the craze of, um, let's just say, collectors, you know, you know, whether specifically Asian collectors or the nouveau rich, <laughs> you want to say, who are now going um, crazy for these French wine producers. Um, and of course, I don't know if you ever saw the movie with um oh my god i forget his name sour grapes where mm. okay everyone's saying yes i actually so, had my students watch that yeah. and do reports on it so they just did reports for me on that last week <laughs> oh good so it's fresh in your mind i haven't seen yeah. it recently i've seen it when it first came, was put on netflix but obviously if you don't know for anybody that's watching or watching this on replay go check out sour grapes on netflix um it is about and i forgot what country he's from so i'm not going to say china but it is about a asian um, collector who then resells wines but are making fake versions because he knows the market is going crazy and he's specifically French I don't think he's selling anything else um, but that kind of tells you that the craze is really there that people are willing to <coughs> spend money on these wines so it's a follow-up yeah, question to the first the question popular, but basically so, let me yeah. know what you think is helping the second wave uh, crave of um, people who are now into new money that are actually trying to buy French wine. When you talk about China, Cha, it's not about France. It's not about the taste of uh, French wines. It's a status. They are buying a status. They are buying expensive wines. They are buying Lafitte La Rothschild. And uh, uh, it's not a question of taste. It's not a question of how good is the wine. It's not a question of where it comes from. It's just a way to show that you have a lot of money and you can open this bottle. Uh, it could have been Italy, it could have been Spain, whatsoever. We work with Vega Sicilia in Spain. We work with famous uh, winemaker like Antinori in, uh, in Italy. They produce some expensive wines and uh, they, they do very well also in, um, in China. The thing is um, you have some markets where they buy just for status thing, just to show that they have money and you have some market where they buy the wines because they are great. And um, in, uh, in America, we were talking about Brits. They have a taste. They discovered <clears throat> they made port. If Portugal is so famous, thanks to port, it's be- thanks to the Brits. If Bordeaux is so famous, the first growth, it's thanks to the Brits, the ranking and and so the thing is, you have some places in the world where they buy the wine for the taste. And you have some other places, they buy the wine for the price. It's two things which are different. But at the end of the day, in France, we have some expensive wines. And this wine, sometimes they taste very good. 
And that's the reason why France is also so famous because when Chinese people come to Bordeaux, for example, they go to the chateau and at the chateau, they open a 1945 Mouton or Child, for example. And it's not only a great wine, it's not only expensive, it's, a, it's, a, it's history, it's something else. Nobody can buy it, it's just an experience. And now what people are looking for all over the world, it's about experience. And France can offer this, it's a, an experience. And it's expensive wines, great wines with an experience. And that's the reason why in China they are so <laughs> um, happy and uh, they, they, they so eager, so, um, so, so much into French wines. But uh, it's, it's a mix of everything. It's not only a taste. I fully agree. And um, uh, to go on off of what Guillaume was saying, it is it goes beyond that taste. Uh, I think people also look at France in general as just luxury. Like if you yeah. tell someone France, everyone knows Paris. Right. Like literally every person knows Paris is in France. And people come, people dream about Paris. People dream about France to come visit. When you think luxury, you usually think French things, even outside of wine. If you're talking luxury mm -hmm. handbags and luxury shoes and luxury perfume, you still think France. And so it's just a natural thing that if France has <coughs> wine, you look at that as luxury too. And then also going back to what Guillaume was saying about the wine, nothing to do with taste, but a lot of people are just buying wines because they're older. You think of who has the oldest wines that are still available. You're talking France, you're talking Italy. Um, other people do make wine, but you're not going back that far. You're not buying anything from the what 30s and 40s, necessarily from Portugal or Spain. No shade, but that just isn't available. It is shade and we do No, it wasn't it. shade. It just, <laughs> it would be shade if it wasn't true. I'm speaking no, back. but I mean, like Spain, are you kidding me? That's one of the best uh, cellaring systems like Rioja. That is what they're known for, keeping aged wine that they can sell that they didn't actually even bottle. That is, you know, in their mind, it was the um, the cellaring of it. And I, you know, again, so yes, I am playing devil's advocate. That, but that's because I go, you know, if, if France is going to be great, I want France... French people to defend it. It gotta be more, you know, in this case, I hear the status level and I see it, right? We know it exists. Everything Tanisha said about the perfume, the handbags makes sense, but own that, not that your wine is better than the world, you know, is own that your country or France itself has developed this uh, status related to luxury and therefore the wines is then associated with luxury at this price point etc cetera, etc cetera. because there are some really great wines around the world for cheaper price that are very they could be cheaper price compared to the ones that a 500 bottle from bordeaux versus a 100 bottle from by Hada, I'm saying the idea is that it's still way cheaper than the ones <clears> from Bordeaux, <throat> even though the quality may both be phenomenal. That extra $400 or euros is associated to the branding of that chateau, the branding of Bordeaux, the luxury status. And so there goes some inflation, inflation that, that's attached to that more than that wine or that cellar is better than the one in yeah. my house. I don't think anyone here actually said like, if this wine is the best or this no, wine no, no, is no, no. better. But I, but I wanted okay. to, I just wanted like, to say that. Right? I, wanted like, I don't think, I mean, Carrie probably would about her wine as she should, but I don't think no. anybody else here has said, Never. this wine is the best. But, um, but I don't, that's the point is because with it. Yeah. the idea is that people beyond this room, this uh, chat room will hear this. And so the, the folks who are just consumers who don't do any research, who are just, you know, digesting wine and they feel like, oh, it's from France. So therefore it's better. We, we have to be the ones as the educators, as the one who put together these experiences to be the ones to challenge it. So in that case, if, that, if I play that role today, but then I'm asking you to support either what they're thinking or what we all know to be true. So it's just kind of more of a, it's, um, how do we open it up? You know, and this is just meant to have a discussion about it. I'm not saying that okay. you said it. <laughs> well, and that, that will be the ironic thing once my region is revealed because um, 
it, it, especially if you look within France, but uh, outside of France as well, my region is not, even though we are in France, it's not known as the luxury uh, region of the world. So that could be an interesting kind of contrast. already telling us where we know, but it's kind of okay. So I always <laughs> ask, before we get into the tasting, I always ask a question. I always, uh, I play Oprah. I'm the fairy godmother of money <laughs> and, um, in this case. And I want to donate a check to you guys. Normally, I give a lot of money to folks. So I, I have two questions. One, I don't have a lot of money. And you're all my stepchildren. So I already gave it out already. Sorry to everybody in Portugal the week before that in California. So there's not a lot of money left. So yes. now we're in France. And you have not too much money to spend. Where are you going? for quality wine in France in a region that's not maybe so well known with this associated status. So Carrie, we can even exclude her from this because clearly she's basically saying that is what I do. Or, I mean, we already know your region. I know your region and your region is on the website. I just didn't tell them what grape you're doing. So in this case, we can start with you and you can defend your region or you can leave your region to when we do the tasting and just use, and use a second. This is a second check. You're going to open up another winery, and I'm going to help you invest um, invest in this new winery. But it has to be an unknown, or let's say, lesser known region in France, and why? That I would choose. Yes, I'm giving you money. Um, lesser known. See, because my passion would definitely be in the Loire as well. Okay. Um, but uh, I guess, you know, I think Gaillac is quite interesting and um, over near the Pyrenees, kind of um, near the Atlantic coast, I think, I think that would be an interesting place if it's with some cooler you influence. you say a sub-region that you would want to choose? Uh, Anjou, Anjou, Anjou Noir. Okay. And then you say in the Gaillac as your follow-up. Yeah, or yeah, anywhere with um, more uh, Atlantic uh, Atlantic influences, and um, I would also like some altitude. So um, that I've never thought about that before, so it's kind of a hard question to answer um, because obviously, wait, do I have all the money in the world? No, you are. No. She's giving children. you a little check. I'm giving you a little charity piece. And that's all. I'm sorry, France. That's all the love I have for you. Just so you only have a, mm. yeah. Uh, okay. Printing machine. <laughs> printing machine. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I think I would probably go closer to the Atlantic and, and kind of more in the Basque region or, or around there. Anyone can go next? And if you can do a sub region, that would be helpful so that people can know. Even if it is a, let's just say, if it is a popular region, one of the main regions, go with the sub region that's um, lesser known if that's helpful. I think Nils say, said it all. All over France, you have plenty of regions, plenty yes. of places where we can produce some very cheap wine and of high quality. <clears throat> I remember in 1994, first time I arrived in New York, and some people in a restaurant asked me, what, what wine do you prefer? And uh, with my father, we, we, we used to love, and I still love, Beaujolais wines. And when I said this in 1994, people were laughing at me. They were thinking about Beaujolais Nouveau. Now, when you go to New York, to the US, in all bars, trendy bars, what do you find? You find some Beaujolais wines. Beaujolais is in crisis. Beaujolais village, or under uh, under this appellation, you have plenty of vineyards to, to on sale. It costs nothing, and you can make some great wines. Great wine. What is a great wine? Is a wine when you open a bottle, it's gone. You have friends, and they all say, "Wow!" and it's gone. It can be $8, $10. It, I, I, I don't care about the price. I care about the taste. Everybody loves the wine and we want to open a second bottle. In Beaujolais, you have these things. To, today, I had, a, I had a tasting, some bottles. This, this is a, 
a brouille. This is from Bordeaux. This is not the one you tasted, I hope. This is, I, I, I tasted this uh, yesterday. It's oh, du, okay. It's <laughs> you got nervous. It, 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 it's, it's du trève. It's very expensive for a Beaujolais, but you have plenty of Beaujolais. They drink in the same way and they are great. I give you an, another example to another region. Now we go to Roussillon. Roussillon, this guy, Gardiès, they make great wine. It yeah. costs no, nothing. It can age and it's beautiful. You have plenty of region. I love Loire Valley. You are totally right. <clears throat> Anjou, all this region, you open a bottle. The only thing you want to do is to open the second bottle. It's, 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 they are great wines and very affordable. And you can find these wines all over France. And Nils said it all. I think Philippe, you met your match. I feel like we found the French Philippe. <laughs> Gilly, <laughs> Gilliam is giving me Philippe vibes. So. <laughs> y'all even dressed alike today. I don't know if that's planned, but I'm looking at y'all shirts. I'm like, he sounds just like Philippe. So. Uh, Philippe is always political. So I thank you, Gilliam, for giving us the very political answer that France is great and everywhere is great. But, uh, <laughs> but I, I got from your answer, though, um, that you are, your first choice was Beaujolais. And that's um, spending time. Okay. So Philippe, Niels, Tanisha, where are we going? Yeah. Where are you spending my money? I would, I would go for the Southern Rhone, actually, personally. Okay. Uh, I've had so many great wines recently from the, those lesser known areas like Vin Sobre and Quiran and so on, and Côte du Rhone Village, that, that level, and the Southern Rhone. And there's so much wine to go around. As the, the Southern half is so much larger in production than the Northern half. So you have so much more wine, you have so much more, more to choose from, and generally the price points are lower. So I think I would, if I would have a bit of money, not too much, I would go for that. Okay. Uh, Vin Sobre or Quiran, somewhere around there. And how much is your bottle on the shelf, for example? Once, you know, this wine that you're making from the money, out, <clears> if, I how I'll, much are you selling it for? I'll probably sit at 10, 10, 12 euros. I'm talking now. Okay. So that's uh, somewhere around there. That's usually. Okay. Yeah. Philippe, Tanisha, where are you spending my money? Tanisha. I'm taking it in a different direction. I know we're talking about wine per se. But uh -oh. <laughs> um, she throws it. she's making sake. <laughs> if you, I want Armagnac. I mean, it's still made from grapes, so it's okay. But I think I would go in the Armagnac direction because so many people know of France for cognac, but I am now a huge fan of Armagnac. I feel like it has a much more rustic flavor. Um, it doesn't have that uh, sweetness. It's it reminds me more of. Uh, a whiskey, I guess. I mean, it's completely different things, but I just like the flavor of Armagnac. And, and so do we have the I money like. to spend? Because Armagnac, I'm assuming the, the price is expensive for you to like get that going. Or no. no? Oh, okay. Uh -oh. And that's another thing. To get it going in cognac, yes, a lot more expensive. Okay. But Armagnac, mm -mm, we could do an Armagnac. All there right. Are of, there are plenty of estates in Armagnac. <clears throat> They don't know how to sell their Armagnac. Mm. Yeah, the they, they absolutely have a marketing problem. <laughs> yeah, the difference between Armagnac and Cognac is the same as a, a Champagne and other sparkling regions. In Champagne, you have LVMH. It's luxury. In Cognac, you have LVMH, the luxury group. In Armagnac, it's only small producers. Yep. You don't have this huge group. You don't have this marketing budget. Cognac has been made by thanks to LVMH. Armagnac is only small producers. Mm -hmm. And these small producers are doing their best. And I totally agree with you, Tanisha. I love Armagnac. And there is a, a crazy place in Paris where a guy called Alain Dutournier, close to where all the jewelry shops are on sale, Rue de la Paix in Paris, city center, mm -hmm. And the guy has one star Michelin. He has a full stock of Armagnac and you can drink crazy Armagnac there for a very affordable price. Well, we're gonna talk about this so we can go we're, back outside in a couple months. So <laughs> I'm like, uh, I'm Gilliam, you. I don't know if you we're can get access to chat. Put it in the chat group so that um, we can uh, all share it and then Philippe can put it in the, 
because I'm sure. Oh, share yet? Yeah, we have we have to go first, and then other people can come. <laughs> <laughs> she want to save it for herself. No, well, I'm <laughs> have to go first. Tanisha, I'm on, I'm on board with you with this idea and we'll talk further because I'm, I'm very interested in what can be done with grapes besides making wine. We know that it's there. Even if you want to spend five seconds right now for anybody that's um, watching this video, who will watch the video about Armagnac and maybe they don't even know that their Hennessy is actually uh, from grapes, but um, you just want to explain the breakdown in five seconds about Armagnac. Oh, so if we're talking five seconds, think of it like a third cousin to cognac. It's, you know, a spirit, it's distilled, it's made from grapes, and uh, usually like Uni Blanc and Colombard and Bacot Noir. And uh, <laughs> um, yeah, it just has a spirit, brown, brown liquor, and has uh, a different flavor. It doesn't have the same amount of uh, sugar, or I'd say maybe the smoothness or softness of a cognac, but it's Armagnac, more rustic and kind of uh, rough around the edges, but amazing i don't know the last time i had some but um but i, I I've, I've definitely had some and i i agree so philippe where are you spending my money yeah well i'm i'm a sparkling guy i i love my sparkling uh we do it a lot here in barrada uh we learned the technique with with france of course and uh, what i love about our sparkling is the, the atlantic uh, influence so I would spend my money in the region that I would get a very nice quality price, uh, sparkling wine with Atlantic uh, influence for sure. So where are we going? Because you can go- you North, can make... in Britannia. To where? To Britannia. Ooh. Hmm. Interesting. Keep, you make me want to change my answer a bit. <laughs> All right, go ahead, go ahead, Carrie, because everybody's getting excited about this. It's fine. You can just share with us. You can have some of you can, ours. Yeah, you, you can share. share. Okay. I'm gonna give <laughs> some of uh, my money to you, so you can do a second one. You don't. You don't even want making wine, so we trust you. <laughs> <laughs> so where, no, so where well, are you going? Oh, maybe Limu as well. Limu. Oh, I make some Ooh. sparkling, but you can also make some Chardonnay. Just they, if you have the right side of uh, Limu, you can make. Excellent Chardonnay, and that's kind of one of my dreams. So hey. we'll see. I love that. We move. Oh, I'm going to try to do a recap. I usually have a pen and paper and always looking down because <laughs> I'm always taking notes through this because that's what this is about. So we got we move with Carrie, sparkling, right? And we have Chardonnay, and then we go back to yeah. Philippe. I'm trying to go backwards. Sparkling coming from Britannia. Right, and then we have Niels. Where are you going again, Niels? Where, where I'm sending my money? Southern Rhone. Um, Southern Rhone. Southern Rhone, yeah. Southern Rhone, I remember. Yeah, so and cool, then yeah. Um, Tanisha, you got Armagnac, mm -hmm. and Gilliam is going to Beaujolais. I think I got it. So, got it. thanks for spending my money. I, uh, I can't wait to <laughs> Thank you for giving it so freely. <gasps> Uh, it sounds like uh, Tanisha will have the first profit since she's making a distilled product. <laughs> <laughs> I need more time. Yes, so my money's on her. <laughs> I need more time. Yeah. So um, perfect. I would go straight into tasting, but I did something came out of uh, um, IG Live that I did yesterday that I want to ask you guys <clears throat> in France and your opinion about Donald Trump's tariffs, uh, which started with obviously. Tini, she already seen your eyes closed. <laughs> right. um, I did, it was kind of funny. I tried my best to get out of the question by just like, kind of like, I don't really know much. Like just trying to like smile about it. I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, you know, to be fair, I really think that um, <clears throat> there was any, especially with the two of you who are not, well, three of you who are not American, um, but no one here is an importer or exporter from what I understand. Um, so, which, so I'm not expecting for you to tell us the laws. But from what you do know, what is your opinion on the American tariff set? From what I hear, it still is on hold right now. No final decision has been released. Um, and therefore, obviously, Carrie, with your wine being exported to America, you may be the one who can give more texture to this as well, just to kind of start off the conversation before we get to the tasting. Well, um, I for us, it's been kind of, I mean, a nightmare. I know that uh, probably in Champagne or Sancerre or these other regions, it's even more of a nightmare. But honestly, it, um, that 
before the COVID-19 that put everything on hold for us. Um, we work with two different importers in the United States and, and both, you know, cooled their heels quite a bit because of the tariffs. And um, so in the beginning, it kind of, it, everyone was unsure and, and they thought, okay, it's going to be 25% and then it was 100% and then it was back to 25%. And um, honestly, since the COVID-19 came in, I've stopped really following it, but um, it, it's pretty frustrating. And I will say this without saying that, I mean, the US is still a very important market for us, of course, and um, especially since I am American. But I do know lots of producers who have just put their focus elsewhere because of it. And where, if you can get like, what's the top two countries elsewhere would be as they focus? Um, well, I mean, to start, I, well, it depends. It depends on the producer and their markets. But okay. like for us, I mean, the Nordic countries, that's a great that's a great place to go to the Nordic countries. It's a lot more secure, and 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 once they're behind you, they really support you. And uh, you know, and then a lot of people are going to Asia, um, and then just throughout Europe alone. You know, um, I mean, before I uh, met my husband, we were um, solely in Europe. So, I, I mean, I'm not. I don't want to, I'm not saying anything negative, but I don't think that the tariffs are helping anyone. Um, and, and, and if I talk to my friends in New York, uh, they, it's caused them problems, importers, restaurateurs. It, it sounds to me like it's not really helping anyone. Niels, do you want to shed any light on um, Sweden and the idea of what Carrie just said and lighted it up. And this is something I know to be true from being in um, Portugal, but what is the, uh, what's the thought? Are they even thinking, oh yeah, let's try to take advantage of the fact that now we have more availability to these wines where producers were normally putting more of a focus uh, maybe in the States because it's bigger just in general that now we can kind of get their attention. Um, is there any kind of, positive repercussions on Sweden or the Nordic countries because of um, Donald Trump's um, tariffs? I'm just gonna mm. call it that, the Donald Trump tariffs. That, <clears throat> that's an interesting question. I haven't heard anything from my friends in Sweden that would uh, indicate that. Okay. Uh, Fran France is the, I think France and Italy are the two biggest sellers on the, on the Swedish monopoly uh, in terms of volume and value. So they both they both have very stable positions since a long time. But no, I haven't really heard anything that that would that would indicate a, an increase in, in exports because of that. For now, at least. Yeah. Um, and I don't even well, know if well, Carrie, if you also yeah. look at it from a perspective like, yeah. oh, okay, let's like how you would normally plan trips to go sell your wine at fairs, et cetera, you know, to the U.S. Is it now? the idea yeah. that more people are going to the Nordic countries, like, okay, I've never been to Denmark, let's do more appearances in Denmark or things like this. And I watch your yeah, Instagram, I so I know you do go up there already, but um, but just wanted to bring that to light. I guess, you know, I really just pulled the Nordic countries out because yeah, that's where we've started focusing a lot of our attention, but not because of the tariffs. I mean, that we already um, started breaking through up there in the last couple of years. Um, but I guess um, I just used that as an example. I think it absolutely has everything to do with the import or um, the producer and, and where they sell most of their wines because it can be very different depending on who it is and who their connections are and, and whatever it is. Um, but I just, I guess what I was more trying to say is that uh, pe people are exactly like I, you know, you cancel your trips to the States and you get, you reschedule them to go elsewhere and you focus your attention on those markets. And, um, and I, I know lots of people who are doing that. Uh, yeah, I, I think there are a few things to consider. Uh, first of all, in terms of taxes for the US, when you talk about luxury wines, they are not impacted by, you increase by 25 or by 50%. People who have money, they can buy at any price. So it's not a problem for luxury wine. 
And then Northern Europe countries, they are under another system as we are. It's, it's called a monopoly. And we, we see it with the coronavirus crisis. We see that these countries are doing very well, actually. It's like Canada. Canada is a monopoly also. And we have to consider this also, that monopoly markets are doing quite well in, uh, under this crisis. I think I, I didn't realize, and I believe that because we all regulate in um, the US separately, um, every state, and so there is some states that have similar um, monopoly, like Pennsylvania, if I recall correctly, um, here in the US. So that same theory of monopoly is in the US, but not the same way, obviously, like the entire country for Canada. Hopefully, I have to understand a little bit more on why they're doing so well. And, and Gilliam, I don't know if there is something that you, and are you saying because of COVID-19 um, has helped that? Or are you saying the tariffs um, from, from the US is now helping these monopoly countries actually push up sales or purchase from the government level? It, it, doesn't, it doesn't push up sales, but with monopoly, you are uh, pretty sure that you are doing the same volume they tell you that you will sell over one year this amount of uh, bottles, this volume of bottles, which is great. <clears throat> when for right, well, because we just talked about two things though. So the question is more about not what is a monopoly, but how is the monopoly doing better these days? Is it because of the, the tariffs in the US that's a uh, rippled effect that you think is uh, helping um, for the monopoly countries or do you think COVID-19 is actually um, somehow uh, actually helping the wine industry in those monopoly countries. I think it's two things separated. Okay, okay. You said it was doing better now, so now I'm interested to kind of understand why monopoly countries are doing better at, during this time. Um, Tanisha, is there anything you want to say about the tariffs um, as it relates to France besides? No, I kind of think itself? everybody. No, I think I think everybody kind of said it all. <laughs> So, oh, yeah. But um, there's plenty of articles that's out there that's talking to it. Um, if anybody who are want more information about what the tariffs are, how it started, I had a whole breakdown one time, and I was like, "Whoa, that's beyond what I thought." You know, um, something about airplanes. I was like, "Wait a minute!" <laughs> I was like, "Right, okay, clearly this is over my like." Not that I don't oh, want to understand it, but it's kind of I heard like yeah. one version of it. it airplanes and, then I had and then technology. Yeah, I was like, well, I went. I would be interested to know um, your your perspective on this. To be honest, the people maybe, in New York, the people in America, say, in the states. Well, they as a consumer, most consumers still don't know what we're talking about. So even if we're like complaining on Instagram, like a lot of people came up with um, infographics explaining how the tariffs actually is going to hurt the in you like the, the consumer, right? But they because it mm -hmm. hasn't happened yet, they have no idea. I feel like even. We talked about luxury just now, um, Gilliam. If their Vauvicleco is on the market, they don't understand it. That's now going to double in price. So if you love it, to I don't know if anybody's going to, you know, who's in the middle class who normally would buy it maybe for a holiday or special occasion. Now that's going to price out, you know, um, of their budget for that. And I'm talking about the basic yellow tail, um, yellow, excuse me, yellow label entry level. Uh, or maybe yellow I said yellow tail, tail is, is on purpose. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, yeah. um, but in that case, it's kind of going to price out for that entry level. And then, but, you know, as you know, I've been spending most of my time in Portugal when this tariff things happen and when it um, really kind of hit the fan. So as a, someone is a consultant for winemakers in Portugal, it actually seems more like an opportunity or South Africa, et cetera, these other countries that wasn't getting too much love that um, now people are gonna look for sparkling from other places. So Espumant mm -hmm. from Bahada, uh, you know, sparkling from, um, who is it? Who I love from, I'm trying to think of the one from South Africa, go on my mind. But either way, if they, if they make amazing sparkling wines, traditional method, um, cap method from South Africa, people are going to look for other places to now get their sponsors because they can't afford champagne at all, right. you know, grower right. champagne, large brand champagnes. And so that's actually 
to be honest, the mindset that I've been on, or that's the rooms I've been in more than the ones in the US um, about how to actually combat that France, Italy, you know, the markets that are more dominant here, what do they do? So, and, to be, and I can tell, and I can tell you this right now, in Portugal, I go to all of the big um, wine conventions and wine fairs that happens, and all of the New York representatives from importers, they, I start seeing them around a lot more often. I'm like, oh, they like, it went from like, oh yeah, it was cool. I seen him at this one vineyard on Instagram to like now I'm seeing that same person at every fair I'm at. Now I live here, so for me it's, it's nothing. But start seeing them actually like, if you wanna say shopping the market in new countries. And in this case, um, Portugal being one of them. So um, they probably didn't spend too much time before coming out to Portugal, but now they are. And that's in both the natural wine, um, let's say importers, as well as ones who are looking for conventional wine or um, good, just quality producers. So they go my dog. <laughs> so in that case, I, I would say that's the perspective I have, just watching the tariff unfold and seeing how it hit the market and watch Americans show up in Portugal more than it sounds like they had before. Cause they're telling me like, this is my first time here. So it doesn't sound like they never must've cared that much about it. Cause they didn't invest in trips to Portugal previously. So. I would just be curious to, to, to know how this only will impact the U S wine industry, because I think, I, I, I think originally that's the reason for all this. He wants to support, uh, Mr. Trump wants to support local Domestic wine, when the domestic wine industry in the U.S., I would be very curious to see what that's what that's going to give over time. If these tariffs come into place, will people drink more American wines in the U.S.? Is that going to happen? Good point as well, right? I mean, we have a yeah. lot of promotions. I think I I actually enjoy uh, Finger Lakes wine, and so yeah. I do a lot of education even within New York when I was um, here to get New Yorkers to know we even make wine in the state. <laughs> so if this is going to, it's going to take a lot more education and funding behind the U.S., um, you know, beyond Napa Valley <laughs> um, yeah. to get people to understand that we even make wine in Virginia is another state that's now increasing their uh, okay. mission and brand with uh, around our wine being made in Virginia. Um, so I think I agree with you. Um, I didn't even think about that just now because now I'm the, the Portuguese <laughs> person there. Um, in the room most of the time, uh, representing those winemakers. But when it comes to drinking locally, if that if if that was kind of like what he's promoting it for, remember, we're still talking about Donald Trump. So I don't really know if he has any uh, real uh, initiative. With Ho but if that's the idea, uh, and that's what he wants to sell, he wants uh, to sell Americans on, then yep. he needs to put money into those uh, yeah. AVAs in the US. Like, mm. So, right? I mean, if it really is like, oh yeah, I want people to drink more um, locally. Okay, well then Virginia needs help promoting Virginia wine. New York okay. State, you know, needs yep. help with getting a wine, you know, there. Release some taxes with selling New York wines outside of New York State, you know. Okay. Um, Governor Cuomo has done a, a good job from what I've read in the past and from wineries I've visited in the past and upstate where I think the same laws applies in California. If you want to get New York state wines down to New York city, which is, you know, we're not that far away, then, you know, there's, you don't have to use a distributor, right? You can self-distribute um, in that mm. case. So maybe open it out to all states just to be able to get the wines everywhere. So people can know, cause it's about getting the wines to let's say DC or um, Boston, if that's going to be a second market in, um, the, in the East coast for example, for New York State outside of New York City, right? So how do we how do we convince people in Boston to drink New York State wines? Like, mm. I, like this that could actually sounds... be a whole other episode for you because there is so much talk about this and so much information out there and things right. to say, but I know we're ready to taste our wine, so I won't go into it. But <laughs> yeah. like thank you for thank you for keeping us on is, track. Yes. No, just the thing is that then the thing I will say American wine isn't it's not interchangeable. It's not like oh I can't get Chablis so let me drink a Napa Chardonnay. Those are two completely different things. So if your flavor profile and your palate leans you toward a French wine, you're not going to find uh, an American one that has the same profile. So like you said, you will need to be educated to know what else exists. Because if you ask your average American where 
do they make wine in America? Oh, Napa and Sonoma. Okay. No, all 50 states make wine. So you have options, but it's not like you can just exchange one for the other. Like, oh, I love apples. I can get apples. Well, I'll eat orange. Those are not the same thing. Yeah, so we'll see, um, Niels. I mean, I, I think that's a good point. And that's what Tanisha said, um, that if they're not interchangeable, it's going to take some, if he, if he really believes in that or his team, then he's going to yeah. have to put the money into us Americans who are out here, um, whether it's making wine, making spirits, making whatever to actually increase that. Because if people don't know, it's beyond just wine. It's even cheeses and things like that. Yeah. That's also, um, all right, guys. So, Tanisha, you started with the tasting. So, let's go. Oh, wait. Let me pour myself a little more. I finished the first glass. <laughs> Time. You go. All right. So, it, oh, I can't even hold it up. You can't see it. If I hold it to my mouth. There <laughs> this, we go. If I put it in front of round. my face, yeah. then I put it right in front of my face, you can see it. Okay. This is my glass of wine. <laughs> All right, All right, the wine is because then it disappeared. Yeah. Oh, I'm telling you what I I'm telling you what I get, what it smells like and tastes like. Doing a full deductive tasting. So oh, gee. Ooh, I'm on the spot. I hope I'm we good. We all are. We with you. We hold I, hands. I hope though. I'm good at this. Stop. Um, this I get uh tree fruit, I get some apple, I get some pear, I get a little um, I also get some red berry fruit in it too. I get a little bit of strawberry. Um, I'm giving you some hints of some things. Um, the wine is white. Show the glass again because <laughs> you saw yes. red berry fruit. Okay. Yes, I do get a little strawberry, raspberry, uh, kind of, you know, or maybe it's a darker, but I get a little, I get a little berry fruit in there. Um, I do get hints of yeast because I did read the label and it was um, aged on the leaves for a little while. It does have a creamy uh, sensation to it, a little bit of acidity. Um, it was aged in oak as well, but I don't really get tannins from it. Yeah. This one may be a little tricky. Yeah. Uh, is it delicious? You. Yes, that so, is tricky. Probably coming out. If anybody, um, if you can give us alcohol, acidity level, um, acidity I don't know. Acidity like medium alcohol is 13 percent okay and any other questions from anyone else for tanisha yeah, it's, it's, it's a blend nope single varietal 100 percent something mm -hmm. i didn't know we were blind tasting that so i might have picked another because this is this is <laughs> tricky this is tricky so y'all y'all might be mad at me after this but here we are. Would be mad. I mean, I'm the only one who knows what she's You know drinking. what it is. Oh, yeah. no, I think Philippe knows Philippe as well, does. right? Oh. No. oh, you don't know? Okay, so in this case, but, all right. you will be mad. So just think that way. Whatever yeah. you're thinking, think the opposite. <laughs> Let's go with what information, sorry, Carrie, can you give us to help region? someone guess the region? Let's go with region. Let's forget the grape right now. So, uh, oh. What's about the producer? Can you share that? Can these give people clues about whether soil, whether it's climate in the area that can help people think of where this uh, wine is coming from? Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to think of what I can say without just saying like where it is from and uh, what it is. So I'm, I'm looking at the bottle, like I don't know what to say. So. It is from a region clearly, but is a Vendée de France. So it's not an AOC or an um, IGP wine. Um, it is from a region that grows a variety of things. Uh, and it is a lighter style and uh, um, uh, does not have an ocean influence. But is it fair to guess that it's the south? Can we can we range it in? Like, or is it from the south, more southern region? No. Oh. It is from the south part of its region. <laughs> <laughs> well See, so this may be the most challenging one yet. Let's it see. is, and you made me start. 
I didn't know we were blind taste. You should have told me I that forgot. part. I, I forgot you had this difficult uh, wine, but you got. I think you got some experts here. Neil, do you have any questions? Let's let's try to pull it out of her. Like, oh, sorry, I stumped you. I, I I don't know what else to give. Yeah. What type of a climate is this? <sighs> Are we allowed oh. to ask? Yes, we can ask anything, but what is the what is the region? What is the grape? And who is the producer? You can't ask. Yeah. <laughs> what is the soil? The soil is calcare. Oh, what is that in English? Sorry, uh, calcareous li limestone. Yes, that. Limestone. Or, yeah. Limestone. Thank you. And the climate. Uh, that part I'm looking up. Sorry, I didn't. Oh, okay. <laughs> I will say it is. Um, it is uh, organic, so bio. Ah. Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> well, Difficult. Yeah. Red Calcare berry and schist. Mm -hmm. But so it, what, is it too obvious to ask if it's muscadet? It's you not too ask. obvious. You can ask that. It is not muscadet, but you are in the right area uh -huh. so what's the area what's the region not it is from the loire tanisha. oh sorry oh Ooh. not you tanisha <laughs> uh, you said that too late <laughs> sorry <laughs> never so, mind loire this one's gonna be like pulling teeth then so loire yeah. white and now go through the tasting again and so now everybody thinks they can narrow their mind down to What's in the water? Don't show the bottle, please. I alcohol. She mentioned 13%, 13 alcohol 13. from the okay. water. A very ripe fruit. There. White wine. Ripe fruit, mm -hmm. underripe? Ripe. I would say ripe, yeah. How are you going to say ripe? You're not tasting it unless you know something <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Red berry flavors. Uh, uh, schist and limestone soil, organic. You said okay, red so, uh, berry flavors. Yes, yeah, so berry fruit in here. So Chenin Blanc. We're gonna drop everybody crazy with this one. She yeah, said Chenin Blanc. That's why I'm like, Ch that's anybody, why I'm don't say anything. Uh, I can't tell yet. No. Can it be Niels? Chenin Blanc? We're not gonna say yes or no yet since you already know it's Loire. Uh, uh, I'm thinking Pinot Donis, Pinot Meunier, things like that, that you can have them in white, white, white single varietal version sometimes from a Loire. Uh, okay. uh -huh. And since uh, red grapes, you could get some red berry flavors there, but that's, yeah, this is difficult. <laughs> well, she yeah. just said it's not an AOC, so this, these people can be doing any kind of breaking yeah. all kind of rules. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Gilliam? You know, it's already difficult to say when I taste it. So <laughs> doing it on Zoom, it's even more difficult for me. <laughs> I have no thing. clue, no clue. Well, Nils, what are we allowed Nils, to Nils, Nils, is, Nils, Nils is on the right track. Pin, I'll give you Pino that. Donis, Nils is on the right track. You know, Pinot Dodis, we know that it's it's south part of Loire. Pinot yes. Dodis, you, you can find this kind of uh, wines. Uh, I would say maybe Pinot Dodis from the south part of, of mm. Loire. But what exactly, you know, it's extremely difficult. Mm. Philippe, do you have any guess at all? No, I'm, I'm totally lost here. Okay. Niels, do you want to go a little further before we just let her reveal? Because I know this one was tricky. I just realized after I said her name, like, oh, damn. Uh, Pinot Donis, Pinot Meunier, some, one of those. Pinot Donis probably would stick to that then. That's, that's, that's as All far right, as Tanisha. I can go there. Go ahead, Tanisha. You were on the right track. It's 100% uh, Pinot Noir. Pinot and Noir, okay. Yeah, just vinified white. Yeah, and <laughs> okay. it is um, a Moulin Blanc, so Blanc de Noir, from Loire Meridional, and it is from Murat, who does, um, they're in the Feast Bandine, so you probably know them from um, those wines that they make, but under the J. Murat brand. Can you show us the nice. bottle so we can see the label? I'll put it in front of my face so you can actually yes. see it. <laughs> Uh-oh. Uh, Don't move your face. Right. <laughs> Don't move your face. Like, here we go. Yeah, yeah there we go. Okay, yeah. So it's a blank thing. Yeah. So for those who are watching, just know Tanisha just started the whole tasting with a red grape <laughs> as a white wine. 
if you missed that whole... And that's why I said, I didn't know we were doing this blind. <laughs> Otherwise, I would have picked this one. I mean, I have others. I'm like, oh, we're doing a cool <gasps> tasting. Like, let me bring something different. But the blind part, that was always going to be a whole... So, basically, do not invite Tanisha to your tasting groups. <laughs> no, just tell me it's a blind tasting before I come. And then I'll, you know, bring something come appropriate. In. Come in. You know, I'll bring something appropriate. All right, let's go. I got to go with something a little bit easier because I think that one was too, too, too rough for everybody. So, Carrie, you want to pick now up? Now you know it will get easier from here. So there Yeah, there's not, it can't be anything harder than that. You're welcome for that. Now we all win <laughs> after this, you know. <laughs> Carrie, you want to pick up from here? Okay. Um, I'm not going to say that my it, mine is typical of the region. Okay, but well, let's uh, stop. So... Let's stop right now. <laughs> We need an easy win. We need an easy win. Don't stump us easy. We need an easy win after. <laughs> She's like, I'm not going to say my May, I mean, maybe I'm it's easy. easy. Maybe it's easy. Nope. Carrie, Who's ready for, for Carrie? Let's hear it. We're ready. I'm ready. <laughs> I'm my ready. hand is All right, Carrie. Oh my God, it's weird. Okay. Bring it on. Yeah, we're ready. Okay. Everybody looks yeah, bruised in here. That's why I said that. Like, oh my God, maybe they need an easy one. I'm going to okay. show you in the light. Okay, Wait. we got a little Does color that... there. Yeah, deep, it looks like. Um, or maybe uh, put the put the glass in front of you, actually. I think we can see more the color that way. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you're right. Give us a little uh, swirl action. Yeah. Yeah, lighter. Her, yeah. I have to change hands. Hold on one second. Oh, okay. Let's see. <laughs> oh, that's perfect. Ooh, now we beautiful. Know. Yeah. Oh, I have an idea what it might be. Okay. Okay. Then... All right. Tell us. Talk to us, Carrie. We're no. Ready. Yeah, Carrie, talk to us. I'm not sure about the vintage. Okay. Uh, <laughs> well, that, that can be a first question. <laughs> yeah, I already don't know the vintage. Okay. Uh, okay, so it's 12% um, alcohol. Okay. Single variety. Um, what else can I? You got to go through it's, the tasting. Um, what's on the nose? What's on the palate? You are our oh, senses. Right. Okay. So... <laughs> Uh, we've got uh, violets and white pepper, but you also have some bluer fruit like um, blueberries and uh, even like, I, I want to say raspberries, but it's not so bright. It's a different, it, it's more like blueberries, a little darker. Um, and then the floral and white pepper as uh, the, the aromatics of the black pepper or the white pepper and the and the violets or maybe lavender um, is, is quite dominant. Um, it, has a, it has a nice acidity. I could tell you the pH if you want. Please. And um, it's, uh, it's at a 3.4 pH. So, um, mm -hmm. and again, single variety and um, uh, no sugar. Yeah. Um, so the mouthfeel, it has um, I um, it, it's very straight. Um, it's lighter, but a nice texture. So a nice fuzzy, uh, l low tannin, um, but balanced. Wow. Any questions from anyone else to help nail down this region first? I mean, it's kind of a given her region, but we'll, yeah. so I want to start with there and guess her region now be helpful for us to find a great. Any aging in oak? Um, no, actually sandstone. So Just one year, so one, one year, in a, in a sandstone egg. <laughs> Niels is like, okay, great. Oh. <laughs> what, <laughs> what can I get from that? Sandstone <laughs> egg, no, yeah. no If you knew, if you knew the, if you knew the variety. Huh? Did the fermentation also happen in the sandstone egg or was that in steel? No. The, no, the fermentation happened in an open, very old, so neutral demuy. So a 600 liter 
a neutral barrel open. Sounds very oh. juicy. Is there any carbonic mass? Do you want me to tell you a bit about the vinification? Am I allowed to go into that? So and I'll, 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 I'll say types, this, this uh, is my wine, obviously. Yeah, you can tell us about the weather that um, day. Okay, so there is a uh, cold soak maceration of about a week, maybe more like five days. Um, and uh, I made a lot of sanye. Uh, so the skin to juice ratio is high. Um, no punch downs. And pressed early, so the vinification is finished in the sandstone egg. Any takes? Nothing. <laughs> That's like uh, so, the terroir. Tell us about your location. Where you at? So, um, so um, like, walk out to the vineyards if you must. <laughs> <laughs> you can't see vineyards from here. So uh, okay. one thing about the region is it, there, there's a wide uh, array of uh, different uh, soils. And uh, the focus of the project is on single varieties on single soils. So this particular uh, grape is grown in granite at an elevation of about 300 meters. A lot of rain. Nope, nope, uh, and uh, hot. Hmm. Wind, wind, lots of wind. Um, there will be uh, uh, an influence from the sea. Is that going too far? That's good. Let them, they all look like they're still thinking. So I'll wait for like someone to pick up with some clues in the same region. Um, a bit south, on the southern part. Yeah. So what region you want to say? I'm still facing good I'm mm -hmm. guessing around. Makes me think of Carignan here. And I thought that too, because I thought Long Dark Roussillon, I thought around there, but then when she mm. said not typical, I think that's what threw me. I'm like, wait, maybe yeah. then it's not that. Okay, no, 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 no. The crazy, like mold or something like that. Like, no, no, I'm the mold. variety, the variety is very typical of the region, very classic. Okay, okay. Uh, I'll tell you this, the vines are uh, about 100 years old, maybe 80 to 100 years old. How about that? Okay, how about that? Mm. <laughs> it's, it's the 12 percent alcohol that is difficult here. Oh, yeah. the what, what is difficult? The 12 percent alcohol, because you're in a hot. Yeah. This is this makes you think of hot climates, you know. Uh, okay, so that's more where it is irregular is mm, in okay. in the alcohol and yeah. in the color and in the acidity. That's where it's irregular, but maybe the vinification process can tell you a bit more about that. Mm. High acidity. A high acidity. High acidity. Okay. I don't know. Some something says Sanso to me here, but I could. I mean, Carignan. Well, Sanso, I'll, and... I'll tell you what. Sanso is definitely the dream, but I don't have enough. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, so we ruled one thing out. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we have no seven hundred other grapes. No, okay. Uh, okay. The the, the grape. We have the all grape nine. Is it is, it is so, the, when you find out the grape, th this wine is so unlikely of this grape. It's, it, it's so not typical of this. Like that's what makes this wine different is um, uh, how this grape is being presented. Because it, it, once you find out the grape, it, um, and if you were actually here to taste the wine, uh, you would be a bit surprised and that is, that's why this wine is what I chose. And that is why this wine is one of my queens. Tell us what would you pair with like a traditional pairing with the wine that you have? Maybe we'll get um, to Well, so being, okay. So can I say a vintage? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so it's 2018. 
so it's rather young but uh the wine is meant to be drunk young and uh and for me um so far since it's a newer project uh I, I like to pair it with things of the region. So um, being the floral components and, and the spiciness, I, for me, uh, saffron and, uh, and well, for me, my favorite pairing with this dish so far is kind of like um, a croquette de bacalao with uh, a rui, like a rich rui. So, so um, like, a, like fried uh, salted cod with... Um, an aioli of uh, saffron and roasted red pepper and, and uh, garlic and olive oil. They got excited, you know, whenever you got a Portuguese person in the room and they hear bacalao, it's like, yeah. you're speaking their language, so. She said, she said I'm straight. That right there is a big uh, hint as well. And Gilliam, aren't you from the South of France? No, I'm, I'm like Nils. Uh, I, I, I wanted to say Sanso uh, for, for, for this wine. And when uh, Kerry said uh, more than 100 years old vineyards, I don't know about uh, very old Sanso. Uh, so I go, I go straight to, uh, to Carignan. Mm. Very old vines of, of Carignan. Of course, this is what you can find, I would say, easily. Uh, 12% is complicated. Uh, once again, it's already difficult to taste it blind when you taste the wine. So doing it when, without tasting it is very, very difficult. But I'm pretty sure it's good. So, uh, sure so it's we're good. not going to have a win with Carrie. We're not uh, going to have a win blind tasting Carrie. Right. I was like, yeah, Carrie. So mm. I'm guessing since now two or three Bernache. people already said carry on. Is it not carry on either? Grenache, very old Grenache. Grenache, yeah. It's old Grenache. Grenache. Oh. Oh, okay. Yeah. Bravo, Nils. Bravo, Nils. <laughs> yeah. It's tough. It's tough. Early harvest in Grenache. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. Early, early harvested Grenache with uh, most of the extraction done pre fermentation, uh, um, pressed early and finished off the skins. Hey, her wine is beautiful. I don't know if I had this one, yes. Carrie. Yeah. This Sorry. wine has not come yet to the United States. This okay. is, uh, I, it is in limbo right now. It is on its way one day. It is on a pallet and labeled and ready to go. Uh, but it is not yet there. Um, can but, we see the uh, But yes, us here in France, please. we can just come down to you to get it, right? <laughs> oh, Oh, I so could get it. Me, and you. You, you in Paris, and I could get down. it to you. And my Carignan yeah, for sure is in Paris because okay. I also make a Carignan. But the Grenache is is oh. is newer, oh. and this is like my um my oh nice mm. yeah I've never seen this label. So this label. is Chromosoma, uh, Grenache from Granite, yeah. 2018, and um, okay. so so. Um, Yeah, you see it on the shelves. Support her. I'm, so, I'm assuming your wines are sold in Paris too, correct? Uh, um, yes, the Grenache, uh, not yet. Uh, the, uh, and in fact, there, uh, in fact, in 2018, that was the trial of the of the Grenache. So I only made 400 bottles. So it's very special, but um, uh, there will be 200 bottles coming to New York. Carrier wines are, uh, I know because I see the mule and I know um, my dear friend, Chef Shaquay came and did harvest with her. Um, Shaquay made are. this wine with me. Is this the one that her cell phone dropped in? No. <laughs> Wait a minute, don't, don't say that. Wait, can you edit this out? No. <laughs> well, hey, they people, still, no. people her feet is in wine. In. I trust the cell phone before I trust the feet. <laughs> Her, no, her phone spent the entire vinification, a whole like month in Syrah. And she dug out the tank on her last day and the phone works. <laughs> wow. I know. Well, that's a plug for iPhone. Look, now people iPhone need to go X. buy iPhone. iPhone X. <laughs> but no, so yeah. Um, yeah, so I was getting to that. I know that your wines are low intervention. You still got the mule in the whole, so I can't wait to visit as you always hear me say. Um, yeah. And, but is, is it also considered bio? 
Um, yep. So organic as well as natural uh, for France? Um, no? Well, I mean, I guess that depends on, 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 on what your definition of natural is. Uh, technically, it could be natural. Um, it's an organic wine that has, um, le you know, about uh, three grams of SO2 or 30 ppm. Um, so very low amount of sulfur um, and very low intervention, uh, but I do use sulfur, so. Yeah, no, um, I mean, I just wanted to hear if do you also say that is natural? It's more about your definition to, to us. No, I, I don't, I, I'm pretty bad at identifying with anything. And that is why the wine is also Vendefrance. It's Vendefrance okay. and um, I, I would not call it a natural wine because I, yeah, I, I mean, I guess technically it could be, but I don't typically identify as that. As that. I don't know. It's organic. It's organic. Okay. And I'm, I'm okay with working with that. Niels, that was you. So therefore you are next. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, all right. Give us a win, uh, Niels. Give us a yeah. win, please. <laughs> all right. So I have a nice uh, medium golden color here. Yeah, I see. Doing the can full you, WCT thing closer? here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Medium golden color there. Nice. You can see. Yeah. Also like uh, the glass. You got to talk yeah, about that. Nice glass with yeah, I, I I usually don't drink wine from these glasses, but I just had you know to take them for the occasion, to rise to the occasion. Um. I'm having butter, yellow apples, cream, a bit of a yeasty character as well. Okay. Really ripe peaches, those kind of things. Cream and yogurt as well. So it's dry with high acidity, but with kind of a round, rounded mouthfeel to it. A really nice long finish. No obvious oak. Mm, I'm still having that ripe peach and yellow apple and cream and butter. Bit of that. But you got the Yeast butter on the nose as well. Yeah. Butter on the, on the palate. And on the palate. Yeah. But no obvious uh, oak, you said. It's no no obvious. My no. Okay. Um, okay. My the second question is obvious. Um, it's, not no what is obvious, obvious but okay. <laughs> um, no what obvious. is the vintage? Um, vintage is a 2015 vintage. So a really hot, nice, sunny year in the region. Okay. Mm, and this is a place that is normally more known for the high quality of its red wines. Okay. okay. We're looking at a single varietal wine here. I thought Viognier at first, because you said the peach and then also looking at the color, but then the cream and the butter made me think I might not be right, but I think I might just stick with that. And so for the region for a second, if we go back, we know, it, I mean, you can call the region for Viognier, but can you just break it down? Is it uh, Mediterranean, continental? Yeah. What's the, what's the- So this would be, this would be a uh, cool to moderate continental climate. Okay. So then that can support Tanisha Viognier, if that's the case as well. Yeah. That's a, yeah. Viognier is, is, is a good guess. No, it's not Viognier, but it's, it's a good guess. Right. Uh, He's like, it's a good guess. Right. I could just tell which, by the way he nodded. I'm like, huh, okay. But you also <laughs> said that the vintage was 2018. 2015. 15. 15. 15. Sorry, 2015. 2015. Okay. Yeah. Because I'm looking right. at the color. And so I'm thinking, what could be the grape for that color for 25 year old wine? Yeah, the color I think is unusually deep for this type of wine, okay, at that age. Okay. Alcohol level is 13%, a fairly classic. And acidity is, is quite high. Okay. Mm. So high, higher than you would typically expect for Viognier. Yeah, now that you said that. I would think recently it's coming from high acid, but then like, where they make Riesling is known for white wines and not mm -hmm. a typical region for red. Mm -hmm. So what else can you tell us about the terroir? Uh, so normally this is, like I said, this is a, this place is more known for its red wines. Yeah. Uh, this is a very tiny percentage that is made into white wines here. So it's more of an, of an oddity. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> finding white wines here. That uh, the region is more known for its red wines, clearly single varietal, lifestyle red wines. Uh, and then you say continental climate. Mm -hmm. And I would add information. Um, let me see here if I have any. Yeah, that's not gonna help me. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, but that's just me. It's, it's you know, five other people in here. Yeah, there was a bit of clay. Again, a bit of clay. Uh, that's um, pretty much all the information I have here uh, about that. So it's a very classic origin, really. Right, the I, region, I, just, I mean, is very classic, but the, 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 the wine style itself is quite unusual for the region. This is the craziest thing, because I'm like, oh, France is going to be way too easy. It's about no, a it's not, because we're grabbing all the, you know, we're the oddballs. Yeah, yeah, I didn't think that was happening. So in this case, yeah. I'm like, oh, man. And it's, so, and it's single varietal, not a blend. Uh, yep, single varietal. Um, Marsan? Uh, no, actually no. no. He's like, no, it's not. No. That's Gilliam, all Philippe, anybody? <laughs> He's going to help Tanisha out. She's out here like, right, right. I'm flailing, I'm on. flailing here. Yeah. So and I don't want to just go through all the weekend. white grapes, but like, you yeah. know, that's, I have one other, I think it might be, but I, I don't know where yeah. that would be grown that grows red yeah. as well, so. The grape yeah, is really had classic you on meat, So I don't know easy. if you want to say it again. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, can we ask if it's in, in the east or, or west? This is the east. Are we allowed? Eastern France. Okay. Eastern France. Classic Eastern France. So the grape is really classic. There's nothing unusual about the grape. It's one of the most planted grapes in the world. But so Chardonnay, the, is it Chardonnay? Right, so that was my first thought Chardonnay. ever. Chardonnay. I mean, are from we talking where? about. Jura? Or, Sorry. Or, I mean, oh. is. Is it from Jura? But then that's not mostly red, is it? This is this is uh, Burgundy from the east. Side. Burgundy, yes, but it's from what? It's an origin I was going to say Burgundy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's Burgundy, but it's the origin that is quite uh, slightly unusual here for this white wine. Uh, okay, because it's a place that is more known for its red wines. Red, okay. Uh, but it is from Burgundy, yes. Get in somewhere. <laughs> and it's an appellation, um, so it's a, it's a, it's the known classic origin. It's just that it's it's a little bit unusual. Gilliam, you want to help somebody so, out? Right. So like Cote de Nuit, but then like one yes. of the ones with the Cote name. Cote de Nuit, yes. Uh, you, very good. All right, we're getting better. Here we go. White. Let's see the producer. You got the bottle. Okay. Cote de Nuit white. Okay. Nuit Saint-Georges. Here we go. Oh. Yes. Almost. Almost. Not far. You said well, enough I, for me. I, you can show the bottle. We got further like, than I thought we would. Let me lean in, yeah. right? Let me okay. lean in and see what it is. Oh, that's nice. So you want to see? I'll tell you what it is. Yes. Yeah? Okay. So this is Marsonnet, white Marsonnet. Uh, okay. Yeah, I think we so, never would have. Okay. Yeah. So this is really, it's, it's Marsonnet is more known for, for its red wine. Really next to jean Bertin, Bertrand, classic origin for reds. Much lesser known for its whites. I find I, it's outstanding value. Usually, white Marsanet, the few producers who make it, it's just great stuff. Right? Yeah, I'd rather so, be drinking what you're drinking <laughs> than what I'm drinking. <laughs> so that's, yeah, well, well done, Tony. Excellent job. <laughs> well Thank done. you, Nils. That was yeah. good. Well done. Cheers well, to that. Cheers. <laughs> I know. Cheers. We'll have to put it here. Cheers. <laughs> So Philippe or Gilliam, fair game, because uh, both the ladies win already, so. Let's go, Gilliam. Gilliam. Mine is very easy. So I show you the color. It's deep, it's rich, a rich color. It's a white wine, of course. Um, when you smell it, it's a lot of pure fruits. It's very rich. It's powerful. When you drink it, it's uh, a bit of honey. It's um, also pure, pure fruits. 
And uh, what makes it unique? It's two things. First of all, it's very low, a very low acidity level. Second, secondly, the, 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 the structure of the wine, so it's not acidity, but is the bitterness. Uh, after uh, you taste it, that makes the length of the wine. And the, the third one is the grape variety. I'm, I, I love to say that uh, we have to go back to some uh, old traditional grape varieties because of climate change. And this is a very, this is autochthonous grape variety from the region. And this is an old variety. A lot of people uh, started to uh, change for another grape variety in this region. And uh, when you have the chance to taste these wines, uh, you, you think that, uh, you may think that uh, in the future we should replant this, uh, this grape variety. Hmm. If you have any question, please, I would be okay. happy to answer. Yeah. Alcohol level? Yeah. Oh, it's 13.5. Uh, 13.5. 13. Okay. Huh. So, I would so, imagine southern part. Sorry. Uh, yeah, that was what I was going to say. Part of France. The south. Uh, it's, it's more south of France, yes. Hmm. And it, it's very good, actually. I'm sorry, I can't open it for everybody, but it's very good. Yeah. Wait, what, what are the soils? Here, yeah, it's a blend of different soils for this cuvee. In this area, you have, uh, you can find some, um, 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 granite and also some um, uh, chalk and a lot of sediments also in the in the the the, um, the lower part of the area. The upper part is in granite. Hmm. Hair and low acidity makes me think of Viognier, but that doesn't stick with the, the other information. It also hmm. makes me think of Macabu. Hmm. Or Malvasia. Or Malvasia, except, uh, oh yeah. Okay. It could, so be, but, it could be, but it is not. What about Grenache Gris, Grenache Blanc? Macabu. Macabre, I think, would be more on schist rather than granite, right? Okay. Well, ours is, yeah. Yeah, so here, here it's more granite. So what about Grenache Gris, Grenache Blanc, any one of those? No. No? The grape variety well, is very difficult to find. It's, very, it's a traditional grape variety in France, very, very old, autochthonous. Not a is lot it of El is it in other is it in other regions as well or other countries as well? This is the only part in the world where you can find this grape variety. Oh, oh wow, that's a tough one. When you know it, it's not, but uh, it's difficult to think about it. The, the guy producing this is uh, doing it uh, biodynamically. It doesn't help you, I know, but uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I believe that working naturally, uh, organically, biodynamically is the future. And it's a, the, the best way to express the soil and the grape variety. But it's only my view. Is this the Southwest of France? No, no. Chalk and granite, huh? It's a very small appellation. It's 120 hectares. Could be um, Marsan, possibly? Sorry? Marsan, possibly, but again, Marsan. 
This is Mas. Oh. This is Barcelona. Okay. Oh, okay. And so the appellation uh, is. is. Rhone. White. Hermitage. Southern Rhone. Hermitage. Hermitage. Okay. Hermitage. Uh, it's a 10 years old Hermitage. It's uh, called Chantalouette from uh, Chapoutier, 2011. Oh, yeah. And <laughs> okay. I would rather be drinking with that you're drinking too. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you for aperitif. Thank you, Cha, for organizing this aperitif. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not the every day part. I have this kind of aperitif. Thank you. Yeah. Cha. Yeah. Bring, well, this bring, is a, bring the food. Uh, everybody gets to have it by themselves. This is the only tasting you can go to, and it's all all yours. <laughs> you don't have to share. So, um, I'm gonna go and then. Actually, go ahead, and, go ahead, Philippe. I know I, I've kept you with your uh, beret on. So go ahead. It's fine. <laughs> you can go, Chai. It's fine. Uh, just salmon in color. The wine uh, actually comes out. I want to say on the screen, it comes out more orange tint to it, but it's a lot more uh, rose, pink rose when you see it in the glass. Um, so it smells, well, obviously, since it's rosé, it has this uh, fruity characteristic that we all know, but it comes up more of, instead of just red fruit, the wine is uh, this peach, like ripe peach from the jump on the nose. Um, I heard someone say about um, a rosé that I actually had when I was in Portugal that it sticks to me because maybe it tells the difference between the type of grapes that's being used. It has this uh, very strawberry yogurt character um, instead of just like straight fresh um, strawberries on the nose. I've already tasted, so I know that it is on the palate too, but just to give you an idea, you can smell that creaminess too. Um, there is a underlying finish um, on the nose that's uh, green, like thyme or even mint mm -hmm. characteristic. And I would say that this is a this is a blend, but it's a traditional uh, rosé blend from where it's from. That was a really lovely description. Mm, nice, yeah. On a palate, it ends up turning tart, not the fresh fruit goes to underripe fruit. So more underripe strawberry, um, even white peach. Um, there is a hint of like, dried apricot, but that's just on the finish, but um, it's very clean tasting. Um, the yogurt feeling or smell uh, only, but not on the palate. Um, actually, it may actually smell like actual yogurt. So not even forget the strawberry part, but if you actually look at it from, if you open fresh Greek yogurt, um, it actually smells like this as well. If I was to pair it with anything, it would definitely be imperative. But also, there is that, um, I guess, the yogurt lends to uh, a cheese, more like Greek cheese, uh, feta. Um, so I would do some type of salad that goes well with it. Even like a radish salad um, would be awesome. So, what about the acidity level? Acidity is high. Sorry about that. The alcohol is. If let's say the alcohol, all right, but the alcohol feels high for what it is, but it's up, uh, yes, 13. Hmm. This is... It's and in the blend is not a lot, it's just two, two grapes. So, but two traditional grapes from where it's from. Are both grapes red? Both grapes are red. Oh, I guess legally it should be red. <laughs> And the color is pretty dark. Yeah, that's right? what um, I guess if people were looking at a certain style, they would all, always think of that kind of uh, mutiny, that, you know, that very clear whispering angel uh, version of um, rosés. But um, I tend to go with one. That's why I said the orange color is actually what's making it look a little dark, this peach. Have you mentioned the vintage? I have not. For rosés, it's usually this is 2019, so straight mm. out the. <laughs> mm. Well, the the color 
indicates, you know, things like Tavel or so on, Southern Rhone. Okay. Uh, I can tell you it's Southern Rhone. It is Southern Rhone, okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but then there is the, the peach aroma is, is not, in my world, not consistent with Tavel. So <laughs> that's, that's yeah, that. like rosier. Yeah. But you already got Southern Rome. So what grapes could it be? Well, Grenache, obviously. Okay, Grenache, obviously, 30%. Okay. Mourvedre? Mourvedre, yeah. No. Syrah? Syrah, 70%. Okay, so Syrah, Grenache blend, Southern Rome, yeah. Rosé. Yeah, it's an easy one, but this is a easy drinking one I use for a tasting I did recently. Costière de Nîmes. Yes. <laughs> Fantastic. Wow. Yeah. Are you familiar right. with them? Uh, not the producer, but the appellation, yes. It's it's value, yeah. Fantastic wines generally. Both red and this wines goes and back wine. to Gilliam earlier was talking about. Oh no, no, that was you, Niels, who said you would put the money into Southern Rome. Yeah. So, I was hesitating I, between Van Sober and Costia de Nîmes actually earlier. So, uh, that. so. so <laughs> I was like, I know he's going to get this one because he's already sound like he's, he's into this. So, um, so perfect. See, nice and easy. <laughs> this is how I thought all of them were going to go for France. I was like, people are going to hear the region and they're just going to say the grapes and then that's it. But, um, you guys are throwing out some tricks today. So I hope those who are watching also see that France has a lot more than the usual ones that you uh, hear from each region. So um, so that's a good note to also uh, get people to see. So go ahead, Philippe, I'll flip it over to you. Yeah, right. So as I mentioned before, I'm a sparkling line. I, I really like my sparkling and that's what I'm going to present to you today. So we have a beautiful light golden color here with a very elegant and tiny bubbles on the glass. Moving to the nose. You can sense a beautiful sense of citrus. I'm thinking about a little maybe lemon, also some herbal here, and also a bit of brioche here. Beautiful mousse, mousse in the mouth with a good acidity, very dry wine. You can feel notes of white flowers here but with some hints of almonds and again some citrus. There's a great balance here between the mousse and the acidity of the wine. The finish is a bit long and complex and I'm pretty sure it's a wine that would pair very well with rich fish like salmon or tuna or even some shellfish. So alcohol is not that high, it's only 12%. And uh, it's only, it has only two, two grams of sugar so it can qualify as an extra brute. So this is the style that I really like and that I would like to share with you. Traditional method? Sorry, say again? Tradi traditional method? The traditional. almond and brioche? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, is this non vintage or vintage? Non vintage. Well, it's I have no idea. Champagne, obvious one, but uh, I guess that's not the case. So what could else could it be then? Uh, Why did you say it's not champagne? I guess I missed that. Uh, see, that's what I would say too, not champagne. <laughs> yeah, just... The Guarchemin was made in October 2018. George Minun, okay. What else? It has aged uh, 32 months on Rex. Time on Lee's, it mentions or no? No. It doesn't mention. Is it? It's a. Uh, it's it's a very small producer, in that area. It's. What else? Uh, 
Well, I guess we have to make it's a the blend. difference. It's a blend, uh, for sure. Two grapes. Okay. Are they classic grapes that you would find in Champagne? <laughs> it's more specifically Champagne. <laughs> <laughs> of course, that's that's the classic ones. It's it's really old school. Okay, but it is not champagne. No, I didn't mention that it's not champagne. It's it can be champagne. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, ah. So, so you guys look scared to say it. So is it champagne? It is. Yeah. Is it champagne? <laughs> yeah, it's it's champagne, guys. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. um, you, in you the, the we only have uh, three grapes in champagne to use. So in this yeah. case, anybody want to make Philippe before you tell what, them? What's, what's anybody what's... want to make a guess on what two grapes you think out of the three? Uh, Actually, you have you have many more than three very great varieties in champagne to use we as a talk, we, we only talk about chardonnay pinot noir and pinot meunier but you have petit meulier you have plenty of but nobody knows about it because big champagne houses they yeah. don't use them but with climate the change one. yes but with climate change they are coming back mm. to them actually mm. so you saying to be a interesting champagne you can use other grapes outside of the three I'm, i know that there's other grapes that grow there but i thought in order for it to be registered as champagne and you know for the aoc it needs yes. to have the three no no you you have something like 10 grape varieties that ten. Go into okay champagne. yes there yeah. you go <laughs> Okay, guys, so it's 70% uh, Pinot Noir, 30% Chardonnay from the Verzi area, uh, a little bit up on the mountains on Rams. Uh, it's from a very small producer called uh, Mouzon Le Roux, and the uh, champagne is called uh, La Tavique. So, hope you enjoy it. Yeah, sounds very and nice. I'll post everybody's. I hope you uh, enjoy it. Yeah, yeah I hope. Uh, a lot. I'm gonna post everyone's wine um, on the website, so anyone who's watching this recap and the bottles went by fast, or if they look blurry because Tanisha's background or anything like that, then I'll, um, you can go straight to chamacoy.com, um, the chalice, which is where you'll see everyone's names, where you can find everyone, and um, actual wine set and taste it today. It wasn't there so that we can do this exercise if you already looked, but I will add it um, this week. So I've heard, I tried my best to keep it short. Sorry guys, but we're here and um, we obviously lost a soldier. Um, so just wanna thank you who've been, who actually followed us live today. Thank you for those who are watching the replay and thanking my, the new friends I have now in France, Gilliam and Niels. And for those I already know, my love, Carrie, can't wait to have your mind again, and Tanisha. So we're gonna take a actual screenshot with our bottles, and but this ends the the live streaming portion. So thanks, guys, for we'll always drink France. So forever, France. I know we'll we'll continue to happen. So we're gonna take the screenshot, Philippe. Yeah. So oh. let's do this. Here we go. Three, two, one, go. Right. Thank you. All right, thanks guys. Thank Let you me guys. in the thank you. Thank, thank you so you. much.